So all you have to do is go about your day. Don't act weird and everyone thinks you're just a regular guy. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're discussing the untold story of Ted Bundy. He's not the great sly killer that people thought he was. For this video, we're looking at the life and crimes of the notorious serial killer. Bundy was infamously charismatic. Do you think there are telltale signs of the monster beneath in interviews, or was he just too calculating? Let us know in the comments. Childhood. On November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont, Eleanor Louise Cowell gave birth to her son Theodore Robert Cowell at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers. The son we raised was a wonderful, good person. He was the perfect young man. To avoid the scandal of having a child out of wedlock, the boy was raised by his maternal grandparents, believing they were his actual parents and that his birth mother was his older sister. He wouldn't learn the truth until later in life. In 1950, Theodore, now Ted, moved from Philadelphia to Tacoma, Washington with his mother, where she met and married Johnny Bundy within a year. Together, they had four children. Our house was on Sheridan Street in Tacoma. The second house from the corner on the west side of the street. Details of Bundy's troubled adolescence vary, as he gave conflicting accounts later in interviews that usually contradicted what others witnessed. First relationships. In 1965, Bundy graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School and briefly went to the University of Puget Sound before going to the University of Washington. By 1968, he had dropped out and started working and volunteering in political campaigns. I mean, he was thought to be sort of a rising star in the Republican Party in Washington State. People thought he was gonna be, you know, a young Ted Kennedy, but for the Republican Party. Around that time, his girlfriend, Diane Edwards, broke up with him for immaturity and lack of ambition. According to biographer Anne Rule, shortly after this, he learned that his sister was really his mother. He began dating single mother Elizabeth Klepfer, a relationship that would last seven years. Elizabeth Klepfer was a young mother and she was just getting over a terrible relationship. One night she meets a charming stranger in a bar. It's Ted Bundy. They start having an incredible relationship in her mind. By the 1970s, he had returned to the University of Washington and graduated with a degree in psychology. He graduated in June of 72 from the University of Washington with a degree in psychology. Why does he get a degree in psychology? From my view, he does that because he wants to be able to continue to manipulate people. During this time, he worked at a crisis center hotline and served on the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. Unknown to Klepfer, he had begun to abuse her young daughter, Molly. He also started seeing Edwards again, and the two became engaged before Bundy suddenly cut off all communication. Edwards would later express her belief that Bundy had planned this out as revenge. Many of his eventual victims, as well as Klepfer, shared similar physical traits to Edwards, such as long straight hair parted in the middle. Bundy would dispute this, claiming that the only commonalities were youth and beauty. Washington Murders Bundy's first known victim was University of Washington student Karen Sparks, although he may have started killing years before. On January 4th, 1974, he brutally attacked Sparks in her apartment while she slept. She survived, but was left with permanent physical damage. From January to June, more female college students went missing in Washington and Oregon. Linda Ann Healy, Donna Gail Manson, Susan Elaine Rancourt, Roberta Kathleen Parks, Brenda Carol Ball and George Ann Hawkins. George Ann Hawkins was last seen Monday evening shortly after midnight. She had been visiting at the Beta House and was returning to her house just a half block away down this alley. On July 14th, Bundy brazenly abducted two women from Lake Sammamish Park in Issaquah, Washington. With his arm in a sling, he approached multiple women asking for help unloading his boat from his Volkswagen Beetle. Janice Ann Ott agreed to help him. Then later that day, Denise Marie Naslin did the same. This was the last time they were seen alive, and their remains wouldn't be found for months. And that's when this same suspect, with his arm in a sling, approached Denise Naslin, standing nearby the restroom with a similar story, and she went with him, we believe, willingly to go help him, and then she was never seen again. Witnesses came forward with descriptions of him and his vehicle, with one having overheard him introduce himself as Ted. With this information, 
police were able to get a composite sketch out to the media. There were 40,000 people out here on that day, and some of them had been asked by a good-looking young man wearing an arm cast to help load his sailboat on the car in the parking lot beyond. These same witnesses provided information for a police sketch. His long-term girlfriend Klepfer found the description eerily similar to her seemingly perfect boyfriend, and she reported him to police, as did a University of Washington professor and co-worker at the Department of Emergency Services. Detectives were inundated with other tips, however, and Bundy had no criminal record, so he flew under the radar. Liz turned in Ted and the police never did anything with it. She called the police more than once, stating that she believed her boyfriend, Ted Bundy, was the killer. Utah murders. In August 1974, Bundy was accepted into the University of Utah Law School in Salt Lake City. When I was there at the law school, I would have regular contact with Ted Bundy, uh, and everyone really liked him. Women started to disappear in the area, including Nancy Wilcox, who went missing on October 2nd. Days later, University of Utah student Rhonda Stapley was assaulted after she accepted a ride from Bundy. When he was distracted, she was able to escape. Within a week, the daughter of a police chief, Melissa Ann Smith, also went missing. Authorities found her body nine days later in Summit Park. That Halloween, Laura and Amy vanished, her body discovered in the mountains a month later. On November 8th, Bundy approached 18-year-old Carol DeRanche at the Fashion Place Mall in Murray, pretending to be a police officer, alerting her about an attempted break-in to her car. What makes the Carol DeRanche abduction so pivotal is that she's the only one who ever got away from Bundy. She went with him, believing they were going to a police station. Instead, he pulled her over and attempted to handcuff her. She fought back, managed to get away, and reported the incident to the real police. Roughly four hours later, Bundy abducted and killed high school student Deborah Jean Kent. The first one didn't work out. He's now frustrated, and so he goes to find a second victim. Klepfer, who was still in a relationship with Bundy, contacted the authorities twice more with her suspicions, but witnesses failed to identify him from a photo lineup. From January to April 1975, three women went missing in Colorado, Karen Eileen Campbell, Julie Cunningham, and Denise Lynn Oliverson. In later interviews, Bundy confessed to also kidnapping Lynette Dawn Culver from her junior high school in Pocatello, Idaho, and drowning her at his hotel room in May, then disposing of her body in a nearby river. Arrests and escapes. By June 1975, Ted Bundy returned his criminal activities to Utah. On June 28th, Susan Curtis vanished from Brigham Young University's campus. On the night of August 16th, Bundy was driving through a quiet residential area likely looking for his next victim. Seeing this, Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Hayward pulled him over and searched his vehicle, coming across a concerning set of items including a ski mask, rope, handcuffs, a crowbar, and an ice pick. In his car, he had what we would call burglary tools, the ski mask, pantyhose with the eyes cut out. He had a pair of handcuffs. Hayward arrested him, but there wasn't enough evidence to keep him in custody. Detectives interviewed Klepfer and found hairs from Campbell, Smith, and Durant in Bundy's car. On October 2nd, Durant identified him from a lineup as the officer she encountered. Carol Durant came to the police station, was shown a lineup, and was able to identify Bundy as the person who attacked her. And in February 1976, Bundy was tried for kidnapping her and sentenced to one to 15 years in Utah State Prison. In January 1977, Bundy was transferred to Aspen, Colorado to be tried for Campbell's murder. Hairs in his Volkswagen bug were of victims from Colorado in Utah. And that gave them enough evidence to file on him in Colorado with a first degree murder and kidnapping charge. As a former law student, he insisted on representing himself in court and in turn was allowed library privileges. During a recess on June 7th, an unsupervised and unshackled Bundy leapt from the second story window of Colorado's courthouse library. The guard went outside for a smoke. The windows were open and the fresh air was blowing through and the sky was blue. And I said, I'm ready to go. I walked to the window and jumped out. Six days later, he was caught once again after being pulled over by cops. He actually stood a good chance of acquittal in trial, but instead plotted another escape. Thanks to visitors, including Carol Ann Boone, 
one of the many women he had dated while also in a relationship with Klepfer. He amassed $500 in cash. On the night of December 30th, Bundy escaped again after he squeezed his way through an opening in the ceiling of his jail cell, emerging in a jailer's apartment and changing out of his prison attire. This is astounding stuff. And he gets out into the night and he's free again. Florida murders and trials. In the very early hours of January 15th, 1978, Bundy entered Florida State University's Chi Omega sorority house and viciously attacked four sleeping students. Margaret Bowman, Lisa Levy, Kathy Kleiner, and Karen Chandler. While Kleiner and Chandler survived, Bowman and Levy were killed. As sorority sister Nita Neary came home, Bundy left the house and went looking for another victim. He broke into the apartment of student Cheryl Thomas and attacked her, leaving her with permanent injuries. These were totally innocent women that were, you know, unjustly attacked and two lives were taken. In February, young Kimberly Diane Leach disappeared from Lake City Junior High School. She would be Bundy's last victim. On February 15th, Bundy was apprehended in Pensacola driving a stolen car with items belonging to the Florida State University students. He attacked the officer and tried to run, but was tackled to the ground. The trial for the Chi Omega attacks began in June 1979. We knew we had a big story. We knew that it was a first in terms of a big national, international trial on television. Though Bundy had multiple public defenders, he chose to represent himself again as co-counsel. Many young women attended the trial, identified by the press as Bundy's groupies. He allegedly received a considerable amount of fan mail. On July 24th, Bundy was sentenced to death for the murders of Bowman and Levy. This court independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. In January 1980, he received another death sentence for Leach's murder. During the trial, he proposed to Boone, who accepted, and later gave birth to his daughter. He married her on the stand at the trial of this girl. He received a third death sentence in February 1980. Confession and Execution Throughout the 1980s, Bundy had a variety of interviews with media and law enforcement. He shared his opinions with the FBI on the Green River case. He also met with investigators from Oregon, Idaho, and Utah about some of his unidentified victims. Bundy confessed to all eight Seattle killings and 15 more in Oregon, Utah, and Colorado. He gave police information on dozens of other unsolved cases. The night before his execution, Bundy confessed to FBI profiler Bill Hagmeyer that he murdered at least 30 young women and girls across seven states, though experts close to the case believe the number is much higher. He was only tried and convicted for three of those murders. Ted Bundy died in the electric chair on the morning of January 24, 1989. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. In the media, as one of the most prolific and talked about serial killers in the United States, Ted Bundy has been the subject of many books, films, documentaries, and TV specials. Sorry, ma'am, I'm gonna have to ask you to accompany me to the station. In this? It's the dumbest looking cop car I've ever seen. It's a civilian car, ma'am. Department budget only goes so far. Oh. Former co-worker and friend Ann Rule released The Stranger Beside Me in 1980, while his former girlfriend Elizabeth Klepfer published her own a year later. In 2019, Netflix released two Bundy projects by Joe Berlinger, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile starring Zac Efron, and its companion docuseries, Conversations with a Killer, The Ted Bundy Tapes. I had no idea what I was doing. And I had no idea who I was dealing with. But I knew it was a hell of a story. Stories of Bundy have been told from various perspectives, including survivors, investigators, attorneys, and people from his life. They paint a picture of a man who, on the outside, appeared normal and charming, but beneath the surface was anything but. Ted Bundy is a unique story in American crime. It's not just one story, it's many stories. 